So as Christy stated earlier, I am Corey Ellison and I am a human safety toxicologist in Procter & Gamble. And today um, my talk will be on the exposure-based safety assessment of cosmetics. And you already heard it several times during Kate's um, presentation about this being an exposure-driven process, exposure really um, leading uh, or being central to the overall NGRA, and even some terms in which um, Kate was mentioning about a tiered approach, an iterative process. You'll see that be a common theme here as well as I go through the exposure-based safety assessment. So let me transition here. Okay, so as we think about um, risk assessment in general, there's really two main aspects. You have your your hazard characterization, and then you have your um, exposure piece. And for today, my presentation is going to focus in on exposure, how we can characterize this, why it's important for the risk assessment process. And due to some of the time constraints that I have today, I won't be able to get into these, um, the different aspects in um, great detail, but hopefully I'll be able to provide enough breadth to show how there's different aspects, how we can use a tiered approach and when they might be helpful as you work through a risk assessment. And for the context of the presentation today, we're focusing in on human um, exposure and really ways in which we can identify or define the magnitude duration of exposure to a given chem uh, chemical. So here's this word, uh, tiered again, so we're taking a tiered approach. So oftentimes in the exposure uh, or in a risk assessment context, starting off with uh, a more conservative approach and getting more complex only as needed, uh, sort of this, this uh, law of parsimony where you're as simple as possible but as complex as needed. And thinking about it from uh, an exposure point of view, what this means is first starting off as a external exposure and then getting more and more complex as we go from deterministic, probabilistic, aggregate, and then going from external to internal. And um, so the, these are the elements of which I'll cover today and diving a little bit deeper as we move through the slides. So first thinking um, exposure, what does that really mean? And in this context, again, Remember, we're talking as um, cosmetic products. So for an exposure assessment from a cosmetic product, there are several elements which uh, you need consideration of. So how is the product used by a particular individual? Is the product a rinse-off product or a leave-on product? So a rinse-off might be something like a shampoo, where a leave-on is something like a body lotion. How are they uh, applying the product? Is there, um, are they applying it frequently throughout the day or is it a one-time exposure scenario? What's the duration of contact? Again, thinking about a shampoo where um, you might be in the shower for several minutes versus a body lotion that might be on the body for 24 hours. And then characterizing other aspects such as frequency of use and uh, the surface area of exposure. And when you start to take all these into consideration, you then can get an idea of what a particular exposure pattern looks like for a given product type. And as you take those terms that I had on the previous slide and begin to arrange them in sort of mathematical sense, you can begin to derive these algorithms. And if we first just focus in here for systemic exposure, so thinking about in units of milligrams of a particular chemical per kilogram body weight per day, the factors that drive uh, the systemic exposure are, are presented here. So it's important to understand the frequency in which the product is applied, how much of that product is applied, how much of it stays on the body, the particular concentration of an ingredient in the product, how much of it penetrates the skin, and then the body weight of the, the individual. And similarly, when you think about <clears throat> something such as local exposure, which might be important for like a skin sensitization assay or assessment, 
you have similar terms on the, the top, but then on the bottom, we're now using surface area instead of body weight. And the key question is, all right, now we know what the terms are, but where do we find the data for those terms? And the, the way in which you get this data is really by understanding how consumers use the products and what are their, their habits and practices or, or H&Ps. And there's a number of publications that are out there, either in the scientific literature or published by different regulatory agencies or guidance documents that have made attempts to characterize how different products are used and usage patterns um, for different populations. And the example here is from the SCCS Notes of Guidance. This is coming out of Europe um, from the Scientific Committee on Consumer Safety. And what they've done is looked um, at data that is in existence for different product categories um, and different product types. So using shower gel as an example, they've gone through and begin to characterize how much of that product is used on a regular basis, how much of it uh, is retained on the skin. And from those numbers, it's then possible to make estimates of the daily exposure to a product type. And then once you understand how much of a given ingredient is in that product, you can start to understand how much exposure there is to a particular chemical. So going further down into um, the tiered approach, we have this algorithm, which I showed you on the previous screen for trying to estimate uh, the particular exposure for a given chemical. Then there's choices that need to be made about whether um, a deterministic or probabilistic approach is used to try to solve uh, the equation. So the data that I showed on the previous slide, those are all sort of data points for a deterministic approach. And when a deterministic approach is used, uh, what feeds into this algorithm are, are point estimates. So you have an estimate for frequency, you might have another input parameter estimate for the amount of product used and retention. And once you put those into the equation and then run this model by just solving it mathematically, you then are able to get a single point estimate for what the exposure looks like from a deterministic point of view. But there are sometimes cases where uh, these deterministic parameters might be uh, much more conservative than one hopes, or you might want to include some measure of ability. And that's where um, a probabilistic approach can be utilized, where instead of a single point estimate for a given parameter, so something like frequency, you can have um, uh, a distribution around that. So knowing that not all people use a particular product the same way, you're able to build out these distributions for each one of the parameters. And then when you go to solve the, the exposure model, you also combine it with a statistical model, so something, something such as uh, Monte Carlo sampling. So what that would do is, say you wanna solve this equation a thousand times, for each time you solve it, you randomly select from your distribution what the frequency would be, you randomly select the amount applied, retention, et cetera, and you solve the equation and you build out these distributions to say, from a, a more of a probabilistic approach where we're using more data, how does that external exposure look? And there's pros and cons to each one of these. So again, the deterministic approach being less data intensive could be that higher tier approach where um, it's easy to do, it's commonly understood, but from a drawback point of view, it ignores a lot of the data um, and it, it may not really capture um, some of the tendencies that occur uh, within the data, where the probabilistic approach will capture more of the probability distributions, but it's much more intensive and you need more data to build it out. So the previous slides all focused in on a single chemical exposure. So trying to understand what that exposure looked like for that given chemical, um, or sorry, a single product exposure, trying to understand what that exposure looked like following use of a single product. Where 
we know that many chemicals are used in multiple product types. And in some cases, there might be a need for an aggregate exposure assessment. And what that means is trying to understand how a chemical is used um, within a particular product type within a, a company, um, but also across other product types and even maybe across different categories and looking not just within one particular company, but across the industry, how are um, companies using that particular chemical and in what product types. And then in order to do um, a, a more robust aggregate exposure assessment, you can start to think about what are going outside just uh, the cosmetic realm of products, but are there dietary sources for this particular chemical? And even indirect environmental exposures, are we getting it from just daily living, um, going outside? So once you start to take in consideration these other sources of exposure, uh, you then can start to do an aggregate exposure assessment for a particular chemical. And this, very much like the overall exposure process, can be broken out into a tiered approach where first starting off asking the question, is an aggregate exposure assessment necessary? So in many cases, it may not be, um, in which you don't need to do it. But in some cases in which there seems to be a reason that justifies doing an aggregate exposure assessment, then there's questions um, that follow very much in the deterministic versus probabilistic. So deterministic is just looking at, all right, if we assume a particular chemical is within um, a series of products at the maximum usage level and people are using that at sort of the maximum usage, what does that exposure look like? So it's really a, a summation of some of the, the worst case assessments. And if that is sufficient, when you compare it to uh, a reference value, then you could exit your exposure assessment and you don't need to go further. But if there's a situation where maybe that exposure is in a situation where you wanna see if you can get it more refined, you can go from this deterministic approach to more of a probabilistic approach. So now saying, we know that not all products will contain the max usage level. So let's go out and try to find a little bit more data to say what is a typical usage concentration across different product types. And also understanding, all right, we know people won't always use every product that contains uh, this ingredient. So let's go out and try to understand with a little bit more granularity, what type of product regimens do people use? So really starting to build out a strong data set about where the ingredient is within products and um, food sources, how often or how likely would people come into contact with those products? How often um, are they likely to pair certain products together? So again, you start to build these distributions of data set in which you can sample from to go from this very usually a high estimate where you're just summing everything up, worst case, to a more refined probabilistic exposure. And then you can do an exposure assessment. And if needed, you can also go um, in vivo and look at some clinical measures um, within humans or biomonitoring data as well. So to this point, I focused in on external exposure but there is often times where internal exposure may often be needed uh, for a risk assessment. And this is because from a toxic toxicological point of view, um, the concentration at the target site is really what's of relevance. And in order to do this, um, or in order to understand what's present, it's necessary to look at internal exposure. And internal exposure is really driven by pharmacokinetics. So how much of a chemical is able to survive in the body? Where does it go when it's in the body? Does it metabolize? Does it stay as the parent form? And once you have a strong understanding of the pharmacokinetics, you then can make estimates of internal exposure. And this can be used as a way to refine a risk assessment. And generally thinking, um, a, a way in which we often make estimates of internal exposure is through physiologically based kinetic modeling. And what this is, is a mathematical description 
um, of the human body. So uh, mathematically describing the different organs within the body and then connecting them by blood flows. That's usually what these arrows will represent. And when you do that in total, you have this um, sort of simulated human um, in which you know the physiology for. And you can do this for, um, say, for a group of, or I guess a, an average individual or a population, or looking at different life stages. So if you're interested in children or even infants or the elderly, it's possible to have the physiology represent that within your PBPK model or your PBK model. And even going beyond human, but looking at different preclinical species, you can also make these models for. And once you have um, these kinetic models, it's then possible to make estimates of what the concentration of chemical looks like in the plasma over time uh, and in different target tissues. So no longer looking at exposure in terms of milligrams per kilogram per day, um, but in terms of um, as a concentration in the blood. And as we looked at what defines what goes into a PVK model, um, the exposure scenario is often needed. And this is something that we already talked about earlier and how you can understand that. Another understanding of the physiology is often needed as well. And this is described in the literature and there's um, lots of references out there for that. So really it comes down to your chemical properties and understanding once in the body, uh, what's the phys chem properties for a given chemical and how is it likely to be metabolized? Where is it gonna go in the body? And once you have these three parameters, you then can start to describe and build these kinetic models to, uh, for a particular chemical. So just wrapping up, um, in summary, risk is equal to hazard times exposure. So exposure is central to this. Uh, it's very important to the risk assessment and a tiered approach can be used. We're starting with conservative default assumptions and then moving towards more refined realistic assumptions or realistic conditions. And then um, exposure calculations can be done for external or internal exposures. And just remembering this famous quote um, for toxicology about the dose makes the poison or you can replace dose here with exposure. Okay, I'm all set.